As a video game centric YouTuber, I am legally obligated to mention that 2023 has been a wild year for the broader gaming industry. On the one hand, it's been the best year for sequels possibly ever. It's also been a pretty standout year for full remakes, and I don't mean studios re-releasing an already several year old game with slightly better textures for full price. <coughs> 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 Dead Space, Resident Evil 4, and Metroid Prime all saw complete graphical overhauls with some pretty massive quality of life improvements. And in the case of Resident Evil, it's just straight up an entirely new game with the same story. But on the other hand, if it's not a full-on remake of something you've already played, it's all sequels, spiritual successors, or licensed content. This has definitely been the case for a while, but I don't think it's ever been as true as it has been with this year in particular. The two sequels I've probably been looking the most forward to this year were Tears of the Kingdom and Spider-Man 2. Which, yeah, re remember Tears of the Kingdom? 30 million copies sold, and quite possibly the shortest shelf life in recent memory. It spent its time in the zeitgeist and just... left. If I had to guess, radically redefining the structure of an entire genre like Nintendo did with Breath of the Wild was always going to leave a much more indelible mark on the industry as a whole than doing the same thing again, but slightly better, ever would. Tears of the Kingdom is a masterpiece, but that's because Breath of the Wild is also a masterpiece. Doing the same thing a second time, but improving the experience slightly, might be why everybody just kind of stopped talking about it. When you go from here all the way to here, it's much less impressive when you do eh. Kind of makes me wonder if that's what's going to happen with Spider-Man 2. The discourse surrounding this game has been interesting. You have people saying that it improves the experience from the first in every meaningful way, and you have people on the opposite end saying that it's a safe sequel that basically just retreads the ground of the first game with some minor gameplay improvements. Huh. That doesn't sound familiar at all. Okay, see, the, the joke here is that it's actually very similar to the discourse surrounding lukewarm take alert, but neither of these games are dramatic overhauls or simple expansions. They're sequels. <laughs> they didn't reinvent the wheel. They just made the wheel a little bit bigger, expanded the scope of the wheel story, added some new characters and improved traversal options. The, okay, the wheel analogy kind of fell apart there, but Spider-Man 2 did something I don't think anybody was really expecting, and that's maintaining the same bog-standard checklist-style mission structure that both the first game and its expansions used. Remember how one of the biggest complaints people had about Breath of the Wild was the weapon durability? People were so excited for Tears of the Kingdom because they more or less expected them to either get rid of it or completely overhaul it. Well, Nintendo heard the fan outcry, and to it, they said, What's wrong with you? In what I can only describe as a Nintendo move, they built a new system to improve it in a way that I don't think literally anybody asked for in the form of the fusibility. The weapon crafting system in Tears of the Kingdom isn't a complete overhaul, it's more of an enhancement. The funny thing is, I don't think they would have taken this approach if it weren't for the complaints directed to the original system it was replacing. And before you say anything, I know this isn't Spider-Man, just give me a minute. The primary thing Breath of the Wild had going for itself was the exploration, and the intention behind the weapon durability system was to funnel players back into that core gameplay experience. If you don't have a weapon, you're forced to explore until you find one. But the problem this created was always that if you run out of weapons in the middle of combat, which you will, your two options are either run away and come back later when you're more prepared, or hope that there are nearby weapons you can use in a pinch, which failing that leads you back to option one. So I guess it's like one and a half options. And for better or worse, that's the intention behind the less inventive, but admittedly still very serviceable, objective-based checklist that Spider-Man 1 had going for itself. Side note, I'll be calling this game Spider-Man 1 through the rest of the video, it's, it's easier that way. Swinging around the city is fun, and when your city is dotted with fun stuff to do, chances are you're going to enjoy swinging from one clearly spelled out point of interest to the other. But after finishing the story beats, the side content starts to feel noticeably lower quality in comparison, and very checkboxy. This has been an industry-wide criticism directed to almost every open-world game prior to Breath of the Wild, which arguably fixed that system by making players form genuine connections to the world itself. 
you can see that influence ripple its way into newer open world games like Elden Ring, which got rid of objective markers altogether and relied entirely on organically guiding the player through a world that feels like a real place. But they can do that. Hyrule and the lands between are not real places, but New York City is. Insomniac built a very fateful recreation of Manhattan in Spider-Man 1 and expanded it into Brooklyn and Queens in Spider-Man 2. They didn't have the luxury of asking their design team to create meaningful organic connections with the world itself, because this is a real place. You can, like, just go here if you want. The first most important question they had to ask was, how do we make moving through New York City fun? Because in the real world, it quite famously is not. And the answer is, well, you're Spider-Man. Just make it be like Spider-Man and it'll be fun. It's always been that way. Their second question was, how do we encourage players to engage with our fun web-swinging mechanics? Well, they just put stuff in the world and then ask players to go do that stuff. That's the most basic answer because it's the one that works. If we didn't have a decade of cookie-cutter open-world games that followed this exact same formula, I don't think anybody would be complaining about Insomniac's approach to open-world design, but that's kind of the problem. It was every studio's approach to open-world design, and by 2018 it was starting to feel fatiguing, especially when Breath of the Wild released the year prior and reinvented that formula. But that game wasn't without its flaws. There was so much to love with Breath of the Wild, but for a lot of players they couldn't look past the things they hated most notably the sometimes obnoxious weapon durability system. So, how did Zelda fix its biggest problem? With Tears of the Kingdom's approach to weapon crafting, you naturally gather so many resources as you explore and there's so much stuff nearby you can utilize that you'll basically always have the opportunity to hobble a weapon together to finish whatever encounter you're dealing with. You're never really left high and dry like you used to be, and even though it's still fundamentally built around exploration and item consumability, it fixes a lot of people's biggest gripes without throwing away a system that, in my mind, still worked. It was never about the weapons themselves, it was about how you got your hands on them. And that's something I realized pretty early on with Spider-Man 2. It wasn't about the checklist itself, it's about how you fill it out. Objective markers aren't inherently a problem, some of the best open world games ever made utilize them, but the best implementation has the player engage with the world to find points of interest that populate your checklist of a map, which is not at all how they handled it in Spider-Man 1. You have to synchronize with these radio towers that fill out one particular region, and once you unlock a specific collectible or mission type, synchronizing with towers will reveal all of the available checklist items within it. So what's the difference between simply giving you the entire map all at once and slowly revealing pieces of it? Well, the answer is about 10 minutes of tedium. I wish I was exaggerating, but it seriously took me about 10 minutes to swing around the entire city and hit every single one. In the standalone expansion, Miles Morales, they just give you the whole map from the get-go. Insomniac realized that, yeah, it doesn't actually serve much of a purpose to have to unveil sections of your world when it only takes a few minutes to traverse from the bottom of it all the way to the top. But what they didn't change was how your map was populated with content. In Spider-Man 1, Pete finds a backpack, goes, Haha, wow, I, I bet there are more, are more backpacks around here. And then, haha, wow, there are, there are more backpacks around there. It's played off as a joke, and with every backpack you find, you get a little memento. If you like that kind of thing, it's pretty fun. And if you aren't really into those sorts of collectibles, there are 54 more of them! Why are there so many backpacks? In Miles Morales, he finds a time capsule and is reminded of how he and his one friend made 11 more of them. I remember being a teenager, making 12 separate time capsules and going around hiding them on rooftops that as a teenager I would have never been able to get access to without spider powers. No, you're overthinking it. At the end of the day, both Spider-Man 1 and Miles Morales fill the city with checklists. You already know where everything is going to be, so it doesn't feel like you're exploring the city and coming across things to do on the way, because the games are literally telling you, hey, go to all these places. You completely lose any semblance of exploration when you already know where every point of interest is. It just feels like you're running a bunch of errands at that point, and it's boring. Don't get it twisted though, I still did it because I love controlling these characters, but it's because the journey was really fun. The destination was either a memento, this annoying music thing, or punching a bunch of people. I'll let you guess which one of those options I enjoyed the most.
In Spider-Man 2, quest markers and collectibles are added to your map as you naturally come across them while you make your way through the main story, which sees you traveling back and forth all across New York. It kind of does the opposite of streamlining things by not telling you where they are, but this inherently encourages you to engage with the world, which was something that felt pretty lacking in Spider-Man 1. With the original checklist approach, you'd only visit the points of interest you're explicitly told to visit, but now points of interest pop up to grab your attention as you're on your way to do something else. Whether or not you actually choose to do that thing right then and there, it's going to be automatically added to your map so you can come back and do it later. One of my favorite things about the base game was just mindlessly swinging through the city because it felt satisfying to do, but now it actually accomplishes something. And even though it's an improvement over the original, I still feel like it was a huge missed opportunity. One of the most common enemy types you'll run into in Spider-Man 2 are Kraven's Hunters, who have camouflaged bases set up on rooftops throughout the city. It's established pretty early on that their tech allows them to become more or less invisible. So in one of the story quests, you're given a location for a couple of these rooftop hideouts. That's lame! It would have been such a cool surprise to unexpectedly swing your way through town when, whoa, uh -oh, where did those guys come from? From there, taking down a hunter blind could have revealed the location of other hunter blinds like it does in the current structure, but little tweaks like that would really lend it to the feeling of being a superhero who uncovers an underground operation while patrolling the city, instead of a video game protagonist who has to complete a list of objectives. Which brings us to the traversal options. One of the most important things in any open world game is, for me, how you move through it. And this is something that Insomniac is particularly good at. I will take any opportunity I can to talk about open world traversal mechanics because I like doing that. And hey, sometimes YouTube likes that as well. Sometimes. Anyway, Spider-Man 2 changes things up more than I think it gets credit for. The marketing really wanted to emphasize the web wings, which are, I mean, look at this, they're awesome. They knew that expanding the world into the decidedly less vertical suburbs of Queens would inherently mean you have less stuff to swing off from, but abruptly losing your momentum is a pretty awful feeling in this game, so the web wings serve as both a throwback to the comics and a mechanical addition that lets you maintain your speed until you reach your destination. Visually, this game isn't that much of an upgrade from Spider-Man 1. The ray-traced reflections on the sides of buildings are pretty awesome but that's about all they are. What makes Spider-Man 2 a PS5 exclusive is the speed of the hard drive, more specifically how quickly data can be loaded into memory. There is literally not a single loading screen in this game. I don't mean they're really fast, I mean they don't exist. Insomniac takes advantage of this by centering the core of their locomotion around going fast, baby, and the wingsuit really helps to facilitate this. The side quests they place throughout the world range from combat and traversal challenges, which are both excellent, to doing the friendly neighborhood stuff where the two Spider-Men engage with their communities. And that's cool in concept, but I'd much rather fly in the slipstream of an explosive drone than help some kid hook up an extension cord to a generator. But swinging is what you play a Spider-Man game for, and they did a lot to make that better. Firstly, it just feels heavier. Aside from the speed, the elasticity of the webs was increased quite a bit, so everything you do has much more force behind it. And the fluidity of the animations here is truly astonishing. I cannot imagine how much work their animation team put into these systems. The way you naturally transition from one move into the next is mind-blowingly well done, and uh, I know a thing or two about animation myself. My favorite thing about the wingsuit is how much it feels like Just Cause 4, and I mean that in the best possible way. Controlling Rico in that series is its bread and butter, and the fact that Insomniac basically just looked at it and went, huh, yeah, let's do that, and straight up yoinked it into their game is an unasked for but very welcome addition. I only wish they added more from it, though. A complaint that I and a lot of other people had about Spider-Man 1 that persists into the sequel is how effortlessly cool you look, which... Okay, that seems like a weird criticism at first, but I really love the way Just Cause 4 integrates failure into the feeling of traversal. In that game, you have a jetpack wingsuit that lets you move across the game's map at ridiculously high speeds, and it feels amazing to pull off because there's a failure state. If you land a little bit too hard or slam into a wall, you die. Spider-Man 2 lets you go into the settings and adjust automatic swing correction and enable fall damage, but it feels like a bit of an afterthought that was tacked on near the end of development. I'm grateful for it, don't get me wrong, but I just wish they did a little bit more with it. Let me do this. 
Or this. Yeah. Or wait, why does when Peter puts away the web wings, he like lands normally, but Miles does this weird roll that always looks broken. Can uh can we fix that? Thanks. One of the main points of Spider-Man as a character is how he's constantly messing things up and doing everything he can to make them right. Costly mistakes, trying to balance his great responsibilities with his other great responsibilities, these are all what we love Spider-Man for, and I really wish that translated into gameplay. I want to be able to look cool, but it needs to be earned through mastery of the mechanics. Let's start off with something simple. If I swing directly into this wall, I should be able to enter wall crawling mode and sprint up the side of it, but I don't want it to be automatic. Make it a little button press that you have to time correctly, and if you mess it up, you either take a little damage or cartoonishly slam into the side of it, or when I swing too closely to the ground. If I set swing steering to 10, I'll hover slightly above it in an effort to maintain my momentum, and if I set swing steering to zero, I'll just get kicked out of the swing and switch to running. I want something in the middle. Let me slam into a vehicle so I have to weave out of the way. And admittedly, you can mess up your swing and take a lot of damage in very specific scenarios. If you're in the middle of a trick, you're not gonna get kicked out of it before you body slam into the pavement, but only the pavement, not the walls. If you're doing a full 360 swing loop, you can slam into the tops of buildings, but only with swing assist set to zero, which makes doing that trick actually feel risky, but it's a free boost of momentum if you pull it off. Coupled with an air dash, you can start going crazy fast, so chaining together traversal options is really rewarding. But it's that lack of failure state that makes the game feel like it's running on autopilot. In fact, I'm just gonna hold forward and the swing button, and let's see how far we can go before something stops me, starting now. This exercise isn't supposed to be an indictment of the mechanics that they already have. If anything, I wanted to praise Insomniac's environment designers and animators for even making a system like this possible. Obviously, it's going to be pretty boring to intentionally disengage from the core locomotion mechanics, but it's also pretty boring to essentially let the game play itself. Hey, that also sounds familiar. There are so many cool settings you can tweak for the sake of accessibility, and I'm really happy to see them there. I don't suffer from motion sickness, but something as simple as slowing down the speed you whip around the corners of buildings could make a pretty big difference for somebody who does. Fall damage is a fun idea, but it doesn't really end up doing a whole lot. Other than your health bar getting smaller, there's very little indication that I landed incorrectly because the animation set is exactly the same. The gameplay settings are packed tight with cool tweaks, and I think it would be a lot cooler if they added some more options to fail. That's a big part of the character, and it's a big part of what makes games fun in the first place. Consistent success kind of starts to get boring if there's no way to mess it up, you know? Boy, I actually kind of thought we'd be interrupted by something by now. Uh, I... it's probably gonna be a bit. Uh, while we wait... I'm gonna go make something to eat. Speaking of eating, now would be the perfect time to tell you about this video's really cool drawing of a horse that I made. <coughs>